Johnny Mnemonic, a short story by William Gibson. I put the shotgun in an Adidas bag and padded it out with four pairs of tennis socks. Not my style at all, but that was what I was aiming for. If they think you're crude, go technical. If they think you're technical, go crude. I'm a very technical boy, so I decided to get as crude as possible. These days, though, you have to be pretty technical before you can even aspire to crudeness. I'd had to turn both these 12 gauge shells from the brass stock on the lathe and then load them myself. I'd had to dig up an old microfiche with instructions for hand loading cartridges. I'd had to build a lever action press to seat the primers. All very tricky, but I knew they'd work. The meat was set for the drome at 2300, but I rode the tube three stops past the closest platform and walked back. Immaculate procedure. I checked myself out in the chrome siding of a coffee kiosk. A basic sharp faced caucasoid with a ruff of stiff dark hair. The girls at Under the Knife were big on Sony Mail, and it was getting harder to keep them from adding to the chick suggestion of epicanthic folds. It probably wouldn't fool Ralphie face, but it might get me next to his table. The drone is a single narrow space with a bar down one side and tables along the other, thick with pimps and handlers and an arcane array of dealers. The magnetic dog sisters were on the door that night, and I didn't relish trying to get out past them if things didn't work out. They were two meters tall and thin as greyhounds. One was black, the other white. But aside from that, they were as nearly identical as cosmetic surgery could make them. They'd been lovers for years and were bad news in a tussle. I was never quite sure which one of them had originally been male. Ralphie was sitting at his usual table, owing me a lot of money. I had hundreds of megabytes stashed in my head on an idiot savant basis information I had no conscious access to. Ralphie left it there. He hadn't, however, come back for it. Only Ralphie could retrieve the data with a code phrase of his own invention. I'm not cheap to begin with, but my overtime on storage is astronomical, and Ralphie had been very scarce. Then I heard that Ralphie Face wanted to put a contract on me. So I'd arranged to meet him in the drone, but I'd arranged it as Edward Bax, clandestine importer, late of Rio and Peking. The drone stank of biz, a metallic tang of nervous tension. Muscle boys scattered through the crowd reflexing stock parts at one another and trying on thin, cold grins. Some of them were so lost under superstructures of muscle graft that their outlines weren't really human. Pardon me, pardon me, friends. Just Eddie Bax here. Fast Eddie, the importer, with his professionally nondescript gin bag. And please ignore this slit, just wide enough to admit his right hand. Ralphie wasn't alone. 80 kilos of blonde California beef perched alertly in the chair next to his. Martial arts written all over him. Fast Eddie Bax was in the chair opposite them before the beef's hands were off the table. You a black belt? I asked eagerly. He nodded, blue eyes running an automatic scanning pattern between my eyes and my hands. Me too, I said got mine here in the bag, and I shoved my hand through the slit and thumbed the safety off. Click. Double 12 gauge with the triggers wired together. That's a gun, Ralphie said, putting a plump restraining hand 
on his boy's taut blue nylon chest. Johnny has an antique firearm in the bag. So much for Edward Bax. I guess he'd always been Ralphie something or other, but he owed his acquired surname to a singular vanity. Built something like an overripe pear, he'd worn the once famous face of Christian White for 20 years. Christian White of the Aryan reggae band, Sony Mayo to his generation and final champion of race rocks. I'm a whiz at trivia. Christian White, classic pop face with a singer's high definition muscles, chiseled cheekbones, angelic in one light, handsome depraved in another. But Ralphie's eyes lived behind that face and they were small and cold and black. Please, he said, let's work this out like businessmen. His voice was marked by a horrible prehensile sincerity and the corners of his beautiful Christian white mouth were always wet. Lewis here, nodding in the beefy boy's direction, is a meatball. Lewis took this impassively looking like something built from a kit. You aren't a meatball, Johnny. Sure I am, Ralphie. A nice meatball chock full of implants where you can store your dirty laundry while you go off shopping for people to kill me. From my end of this bag, Ralphie, it looks like you've got some explaining to do. <sighs> it's this last batch of product, Johnny. He sighed deeply. In my role as broker, fence, I corrected. As broker, I'm usually very careful as to sources. You can buy only from those who steal the best. Got it? <sighs> he sighed again. I try, he said wearily, not to buy from fools. This time I'm afraid I've done that. Third side was the cue for Lewis to trigger the neural disruptor they taped under my side of the table. I put everything into curling the index finger of my right hand, but I no longer seemed to be connected to it. I could feel the metal of the gun and the foam padded tape I'd wrapped around the stubby grip, but my hands were cool wax, distant and inert. I was hoping Lewis was a true meatball, thick enough to go for the gym bag and snag my rigid trigger finger, but he wasn't. We've been worried about you, Johnny. Very worried. You see, that's Yakuza property you have there. A fool took it from them, Johnny. A dead fool. Lewis giggled. It all made sense then. An ugly kind of sense. Like bags of wet sand settling around my head. Killing wasn't Ralphie's style. Lewis wasn't even Ralphie's style but he'd gotten himself stuck between the sons of the Neon Chrysanthemum and something that belonged to them. Or, more likely, something of theirs that belonged to someone else. Ralphie, of course, could use the code phrase to throw me into idiot's avant, and I'd spill their hot program without remembering a single quarter tone. For a fence like Ralphie, that would ordinarily have been enough, but not for the Yakuza. The Yakuza would know about squids for one thing. They wouldn't want to worry about one lifting those dim and permanent traces of their program out of my head. I didn't know very much about squids, but I'd heard stories, and I made it a point never to repeat them to my clients. No, the Yakuza wasn't like that. It looked too much like evidence. They hadn't gotten to where they were by leaving evidence around or alive. Lewis was grinning. I think he was visualizing a point just behind my forehead and imagining how he could get there the hard way. Hey, said a low voice, feminine from somewhere behind my right shoulder. You cowboys sure aren't having too lively of a time. Hack it, bitch, Lewis said, his tanned face very still. 
Ralphie looked blank. Lighten up. You want to buy some good freebase? She pulled up a chair and quickly sat before either of them could stop her. She was barely inside my fixed field of vision. A thin girl with mirrored glasses. Her dark hair cut in a rough shag. She wore black leather open over a t-shirt slashed diagonally with stripes of red and black. 8,000 gram weight. Lewis snorted his exasperation and tried to slap her out of the chair. Somehow he didn't quite connect, and her hand came up and seemed to brush his wrist as it passed. Bright blood sprayed the table. He was clutching his wrist white knuckle tight, blood trickling from between his fingers. But hadn't her hand been empty? He was going to need a tendon stapler. He stood up carefully without bothering to push the chair back. The chair toppled backwards and he stepped out of my line of sight without a word. He better get a medic to look at that, she said. That's a nasty cut. You have no idea, said Ralphie, suddenly sounding very tired. The depths of the shit you have just gotten yourself into. No kidding? Mystery? I get real excited by mysteries. Like why your friend here is so quiet. Frozen, like. Or what is this thing here for? And she held up the little control unit she'd somehow taken from Lewis. Ralphie looked ill. You, uh, maybe want a quarter million to give me that and take a walk? A fat hand came up to stroke his pale, lean face nervously. What I want, she said, snapping her fingers so that the unit spun and glittered, is work. A job. Your boy hurt his wrist. But a quarter will do for a retrainer. Ralphie let his breath out explosively and began to laugh, exposing teeth that hadn't been kept up to the Christian white standard. Then she turned the disruptor off. Two million, I said. My kind of man, she said and laughed. What's in the bag? A shotgun. Brood. It might have been a compliment. Ralphie said nothing at all. Names millions. Molly millions. You want to get out of here, boss? People are starting to stare. She stood up. She was wearing leather jeans, the color of dried blood. And I saw for the first time that the mirrored lenses were surgical inlays, the silver rising smoothly from her high cheekbones, sealing her eyes in their sockets. I saw my new face twinned there. I'm Johnny, I said. We're taking Mr. Face with us.